could tell it wasn't going to be a real legit deal because we were the last one to hit the time zone. So we would be the last one to switch over to 2000. So that was, yeah, that was really nice to be in Hawaii because I, I could see if anything was going to happen. It was, we were going to know by the time it switched over to us because we were the last one to get that time change. So that made it really interesting. And I remember on TV, they were having like all these like made for TV movies where planes were dropping from the sky. You know, they had everybody all worried and stuff, you know, Y2K, but Back to 9-11, I was in, I was, uh, I think it was like three in the morning and I was up playing video yeah. games, you know, and um, somebody said in the, in the chat, in the video game chat, I can't believe we're playing games when the planes are falling from the sky. And of course, you know, you get a comment like that in a game, you're like, whatever, dude, you know. And then he said it again, seriously, turn on the news, look what's happening. So I went downstairs, turned on the news and the, the first plane had already hit. The second one hadn't hit yet. So I'm sitting there watching and going, oh, my goodness. I thought it was just a random accidental, you know, like maybe a bad pilot or just a, a freak accident. And then when the second plane hit, oh, my God. Yeah. I, I think I got a phone call like 10 minutes after the second plane. Basically, get your stuff ready. You're on call until further notice. Um, you know, I'm a soldier. I was an Army soldier. So sure. I've, been deployed, I've been deployed everywhere. So I was like, oh, we're gone. <laughs> and so I don't think I got another day off so the next day we reported in I didn't get a day off for like two or three months we literally worked seven days a week 12 hour shifts guarding the gates it was a long time long 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 time but and the whole time that was uh st you were stationed in Hawaii no that was just after 9-11 but I was stationed in Hawaii during that time but I was supposed to be getting out soon and so they held me in for an extra year. Yeah. Um, they call it stop loss. And they, they pick certain jobs in the military uh, that they can stop loss and, of course, be in infantry and stuff. You know, that's, you know, how much choice. So, but I got lucky. I didn't have to go anywhere after that. I actually got out after a year. I was lucky. I'm sure, like, uh, did you work with anybody who maybe didn't get so lucky? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was really weird when I got out. I to Wichita I moved in with my mother just for a couple weeks until we found a place. And, um, I watched the invasion of Iraq on TV in my living room in my mom's place, which was really weird. My mom was bawling. She was just crying. And she, uh, cause she was, I think, cause she was thankful I wasn't there. <laughs> and at the same time I was upset because I felt like I betrayed I know My exact. Gosh, I know there. that exact feeling, man. I do I, not to like not to that same degree, but I do. I I know I could relate a hundred percent to that feeling of regret. So I was upset. I was like, man, I should be there, you know. And we did. I did lose some friends, unfortunately. They didn't come back. So, and I would have. I could have been one of them. So, I talked uh, to one of my mentors about actually both of them um, <laughs> about that time frame because uh, even back in like what was it 2000 like 11 and 12 all of a sudden now we're going into afghanistan you know i was kind of on the back end of acting training and trying to just reassess my life my 20s uh what am i doing you know and i felt that way and i wanted to have this conversation uh with these guys because uh captain america had come out the, the first one and uh i was really getting into you know the series uh or the franchise uh acting in general so, of course, I'm going to go to the movies with all my acting buddies and we were watching Captain America. And uh, I remember this one part of the movie. Um, I was so impressed uh, with the harmonization of the chorus when uh, uh, Captain America is going around uh, singing with the girls and all that stuff. And um, I, I, I just remember feeling so angry at myself for even having that thought, because like it just, it brought me back to some sort of like, I guess, reality where it's just like, you're sitting in a movie theater right now and there's guys uh, as capable as you are putting their life on the line just so I could have the privilege to sit down, relax, watch a movie, you know? And uh, at that time I just started like, you know, uh, getting back into singing. So like, like my brain is like picking up on these little like cues a little bit differently artistically where it's like, you know, that was well executed, yada, yada. But when I, when I heard that, or at least myself thinking it, all of a sudden I just felt shame 
that, you know, I wasn't a part of the fight, you know, and I brought that conversation of how I felt to one of my mentors. And um, he got real with me real, like real quick that uh, had I uh, gone uh, into the military, because at the time I was going to, I was really interested in joining the Navy. I didn't know where I was going to be, but I had a, a decent connection where I would have been at Pearl Harbor for a while. Um, I talked to him about this and like really how it made me feel. And like, he really gave me like, you know, his assurances that had I gone into the military, I would definitely have been killed. And yeah. that's kind of like where I feel the most regret even now, because it's like, at the same time, so what? Like, uh, if I die, I die. What's like, yeah, it's a big deal. I don't want to take life for granted, but at the same time I did my duty, you know? And, uh, what am I supposed like, as, like, you know, just as a man, what am, like, what am I supposed to do as a man, uh, reenact real soldiers on screen, you know, like that just makes me feel like less of a, less of a man and like more of a, more of a phony. It's like, uh, you know, as an actor, you're recreating a character, but half the people like I'm really impressed with who actually have done uh, pivotal things in American and world history were real men, you know, who did die, you know, and they sacrificed the, the, themselves in a, in a sense. Pat Tillman's story is a good example where this guy literally dropped his contract with the NFL and then all of a sudden joins uh, the army, became a ranger. Right. Well, there's no honor in dying. I mean, it just, it's not that, you know, it's not like if, if they were, if someone was to invade our country, God, God help us, you know, like Red Dawn or whatever, uh, you would definitely step up. It's not like you would, you, it's not like you're, cap you're not capable mentally or physically of doing it. It's just, you know, we can't send every single person out there to war. I mean, people got to stay back. We've stopped around this country, so has to move. Um, there's no dishonor in not going. I mean, I understand the feeling though. Cause like when, um, when Ukraine happened, and I'm wearing the shirt here, but when Ukraine started to happen and I, they were taking volunteers like ex military. Um, but the only problem was, you know, if you go over there, the United States would basically disown you. You're not going to, if you get captured, they're not going to help you back. Cause you're, you're like a mercenary. You're, uh, but they were hiring anybody, any willing body that would want to join their military um, for Ukraine to help. And I really seriously was thinking about it. I was like, so <laughs> I was like the bad part of my brain that, you know, the gun ho part was like, dude, get back in there. You could do some damage, you know, but sure. at the same time, I've got kids, I've got grandkids, I've got a life, you know, I've got people that wouldn't want to see me die. Uh, that would affect them. You know, I've done my time, but even if I didn't ever, if I was never in the military, I mean, still, you know, there's, there's plenty of people out there that are doing their, you know, doing their, country right in Ukraine. It's not even my country. So I started thinking correctly and decided not to go. <laughs> well, what was but the thing that kind of made you want to like about it? Yeah, I still fantasize about it. I'd be going out there and because I don't like bullies. I think that's I was going to say, yeah. I hate bullies. And so I see them as like a bully. I was going to say the exact same thing. Like, uh, what, what, what was it that kind of just, you know, gave you the hook to want to get back involved. So yeah. Russia was literally bullying these guys. Then there's yeah, the answer. I, I feel this. I do feel the same way. Um, I didn't feel that call to fight but when it did happen last year. You know, I was going, I was going through my thing. Uh, sure. And uh, I didn't want to take it too personally because it's like, uh, Hey, I had no idea that, you know, people were being called for like real assistance. Um, I had a, I had a silly uh, idea where I could uh, uh, contribute uh, cause, uh, there was a, Hey, give me a break. Will you? Uh, there was a, there was a, you know, a bit of a campaign going around where 3d printing for Ukraine, where literally if I could like 3d print some supplies and, uh, contribute to that cause, like I was really getting into 3d printing and, uh, what all would you be able to 3d print for them? I don't know. They were just like requesting like these little odds and ends where, you know, huh. uh, they weren't going to be able to get certain things from China. It could have, uh, like uh, I remember, like, I don't remember exactly all the little trinkets that they needed, but something as simple as like I don't know, like this iPhone uh, holder uh, on your desk, little yeah. tools like that that could literally like you know, uh, like help them out. Like I three D printed this. It's a I like a, it's a holder for your sunglasses or your eyeglasses. Keep them off uh, the ground so you don't lose them. 
I 3D printed a desk organizer. Um, That's really cool. I, I, I 3D print all the time. My imagination goes nuts. 3D like, prints are it's scary. The future is scary what they can do. They build homes with 3D printing. Well, yeah. And, act, and to that to that point, ice cream cone for your hat, you know. Hat <laughs> hat. That's really cool. I, uh, uh, I did. That's, I, that's, what gonna, that's how they're going to colonize Mars and, and the moon and stuff. Though. They're going to send, supposedly send robots up there to 3D print homes. And then we'll go up there and whatnot. That's pretty insane. Well, like, uh, not on that note, like, uh, I, I, I invented a, a brick that you could actually uh, 3D print and uh, you could assemble an entire structure uh, by yourself, wow. um, which is weightless. It's simple. It's practically a toy. Um, it is practically a toy. Uh, I built it so I could uh, provide uh, affordable cat condos for all my strays uh, and yeah. that I try to help <laughs> out, you cool. know. Yes, yeah, so, but it it expanded because you know the brick could be uh, uh, magnified in size a little bit That's and the durability. Good. That's a good idea. It was it was a stupid freak freak idea, but it really it's working out. And um, I'm kind of I'm I'm talking uh, with some investors. I got um, yeah. a yeah. builder in China, like trying to figure out how to how to make it because apparently when it comes to the molding process versus the 3D printing process, it's just two completely different beasts. Huh. You know. That's but, really um, cool. Yeah. I'll send you a picture. <laughs> yeah, do it. That's interesting. That's really curious. I mean, I don't have any cats, but I mean, I just the thought of it's really cool. Well, it, they're thick enough to where I don't know if they could stop a bullet, but the, this is just pure plastic, but it's it's hollow in some points. Uh, I could put insulation on the inside. So um, if you did have a structure, whether it's temporary or a plastic box looking tent, you could pitch it yourself and then insulate it, you know? Uh, That's really like the main guy who really got involved, he said like uh, sheds and I'm like, all right, what about him? Uh, so basically like uh, one, one thing we're looking to do is actually make sheds with the exact same brick, just use more of them and uh, just reinforce the brick somehow. So, you know, they're HUD certified. So I'm learning all this new language. So it's not just something for pets and kids to, uh, uh -huh. use and play with it's actually an alternative to expensive wooden sheds you know that's pretty cool yeah i thought yeah you know what i think it's really cool it's very simple it's very fun and uh i don't know god willing be on shark tank one day hey you never know you never yeah. know and, and going I mean, back to I, ukraine i, I wanted to an actually... idea. i came up with an idea it's so funny is like i've always been an idea person and I've come up with ideas. I came up with an idea that came to life and it made me so mad that I'd never pushed the issue, but I could have been rich. <laughs> my dad, my father, on a side note, my father claims he invented roller skates. No kidding. He said that uh, when they were little kids, they had these, these little wheels and they would get like these big uh, uh, pieces of like, not cardboard, but uh, wood. And they put, uh, or no, no, he invented the skateboard. I'm sorry. Okay. So he he get roller skates and he would put it under the board under the um the wooden board and they'd ride it. Right. Yeah. So before skateboards, you know, this is we're talking back in the 1950 something whatever. So like these guys are putting roller skates underneath and they're going down hills, you know. Um Do you remember that one scene from Back to the Future? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right before the manure and everything like that, yeah, yeah, the two yeah, kids yeah. like on this like uh, you know milk crate piece of wood. They have a custom made like skateboard scooter thing. And the next yeah. thing you know, oh, yeah. Marty McFly he uh, tears it up around uh, the the court square of Hill Valley. Oh yeah. Well, my invention was these little tags that they were they were keychains, and you would scan them on the soda machine. And, and the, each tag would have a credit on it. Like you could buy a little, and they'd have, of course, the advertisements, or you could even make collectibles like Marvel Comics. See, I got Hulk Hogan, or I mean, I got the Hulk. Um, oh, okay. You would scan it, and it had like 10 preloaded soda things. So you would scan it on the machine, it would take one of them away, and then when it's over with, you have a cute little keychain type thing. Well, of course, that's before they started doing where you put your chip card in there and all that stuff, you know, and now it's all there. So it's like, ah. Man, I was that close. I was so close. Yeah, but I mean, even still, like, uh, if you were you to still do it, but I mean, it, it wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a shocking because you know they've got stuff similar. 
no, but that's, di- I mean, that's different. Like if, uh, you know, kids want to like, I don't know, start getting used to making their own purchases and, uh, if yeah. they have like this ornament kind of a toy function that has like that special, like a uh, reader where it's more like an Apple pay type of a function. Yeah. At the same time. Yeah. So, I mean, the tech is yeah, there, but can, I mean, you can get them in different, you know, like K-pop kids or Marvel or whatever you're into. And the commercial had this guy walking in an office setting and he had like change just falling out of his pocket. And he's like trying to get enough change for a soda. And the, and the cute lady does this cute walk up to him, looks at him, looks at the change, walks up to the machine, whips out her little card and goes boop and then gets a soda and then looks over at him. And he kind of looks at her like defeated and she, she scans it again boop, and gets him a soda type thing. So it's, you know, that's kind of, I mean, I, mean I think you got, I, I'd hold on to that, you know, see if that, uh, like, like that would do really well for marketing for films, especially with oh, characters, you know, it could be like film, uh, it could be race NASCAR. I mean, you name it, you just, you're collecting the little, each one, they're collectibles, you know? And of course, yeah, yeah I mean, it is still a good idea, but. I think it's a brilliant idea, you know, like I can't even imagine how much plastic we go through with cards that got to be erased. But if you got that one ornament that's hooked up to an app where you can just reload it directly from your bank account and then just 10 bucks at a time, just tap, 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 you know, start getting kids used to making their own purchases, you know? Yeah. And you could do it for just vending machines in general. Uh, I guess you could do that. But I think the big selling point is just the fact that there's collect their collectibles also. So they're not just like a dead thing on your keychain. Now you can keep them. And, you know, we're like human beings. We like collecting everything, you know. I know. Uh, I'm, get, I'm, I'm a collector of everything. So. I still got letters uh, from, you know, 10 years ago, like on my desk. And I just don't have the heart to put them in my paper shredder. <laughs> Where each one has a memory, you know. I know that's the biggest thing. A lot of uh, everything I've ever had experienced, especially through acting, like going through the transition, making new friends, you know, it was like a very emotional but happy time. So yeah, I want to hold on to those memories if I can. Yeah, and I'm I'm experiencing that now. This is my first year. I I I, I heard I was like February something was my first year. Uh, so it's been over just a little bit over a first year already. So well, how's that working out for you so far? I've got 10 projects completed in a year um, and I'm working on a lot more. I have a lot of stuff coming up. I'm excited about. So I did a movie. I did divorce court, like a TV show, divorce court type thing. Uh, I did a uh, audio book, short film, TV show. I mean, just endless stuff. Uh, I got some exciting things coming up. I can't, some stuff I can't talk about, but um, I've got two movies that I wrote that I'm working on. Right. I've got two idea. I have two ideas in here of full length feature films that I want to write, but I have to do a lot of research. It's going to take me a couple of years to do research on, but I'm just constantly, constantly working. I audition anywhere from a hundred eighty to a hundred every two months is how many auditions I do. So, um, oh, wow. all right. I'm so aver- you're moving. I'm averaging about two to three callbacks a week. That's it's actually good. It's a number game. Oh, no doubt. I mean, I mean, I just got a call this morning. I mean, it's a, my problem right now is, is, and this is a great problem to have, but it's to say no because it, they overlap other projects. I think that's the big, big one. I mean, it's a good thing, but a bad thing because I, I, I feel like, damn it, I could have done, I wish I could divide myself up sometimes. You know, it's like, why I can't I be, why? I can clone myself like multiplicity. I have to have the one that's not so smart, maybe the one that's more macho than you know. I don't know how to divide myself up, but right, uh, that would be cool. I could do a lot more. But yeah, I see myself in about one year from now. And this is just, I have to have a goal. So I think a year from now, I'll be a SAG member. And then I will, I'll be where I want to be. So I've got my first film, my full first feature length film just got released in England um, okay. yesterday yesterday um all i am though is i'm just the voice i just do the voice acting for it but it's it's going through it's going through all the film festivals in england and hopefully it makes its way here it's called all you can eat um all you can eat yeah it's a b movie it's about a i think i want to say aliens or something and they're pouring blood of aliens inside of these burritos at a restaurant called planet burrito and when you eat it the, the alien comes to life and bursts through, 
burst through your chest, kind of like aliens, except for they look like burritos. And <laughs> it's called Planet Burrito. It's called uh, All You Can Eat, a Planet Burrito movie. So it's it's just the, the trailer is really cool. I'd show you the trailer right now, but I can't because there's still I'm not supposed to share it right now. But it's uh, hopefully we can be- share it on the podcast when it's recorded. I will show, I will share, you can watch it. I'll send it so you can watch it, but you can't we can't release it online yet. So. Okay. Um, yeah. No problem, man. No, yeah, it's, it's, cool. it's really fun. It's really fun, and it sounds gruesome. It, the, the video you'll see the preview. It's pretty gruesome. Did they record it all over in the UK? Yeah, yeah. It's all production in UK. Um, grind. It's a grindhouse movie. Um, so they do the whole like my voice. I do the preview for the Planet Burrito restaurant thing, and they made it very eighties. It's it's so cool. It's so cool. I'll have to show you. See, it's really neat. But. That just got released yesterday, so I'm pretty excited about that. And then I'll be going to Houston, Texas at the end of this month to film in a movie called GPS. And then when I get back, I'll be in going to Denver. I'm doing I I play a vampire in a show or a short film called Ending It All. And ending it all. Ending it all. And it's basically about I play the father, and my son is a vampire. Obviously, I'm a full vampire. He's half. He decides he wants to end his life because he's he's just tired of being alive. So he hires a film crew to follow him around in his last days. And it's oh, really man. funny funny because he can't die. Like he just can't you die. Know, yeah. I can't tell you how I die, but I die years before him because I try something that vampires can't do, but I think I can do it. I'm an idiot. It's really funny. And then I, so I die, he has it on VHS tape and he plays it in the movie. It's like, here's how my dad died. He, he actually videotaped his own death. So it's really fun. And uh, so he tries to kill himself the same way. It doesn't work. He tries to kill himself all these other ways. It doesn't work. He drinks holy water. It doesn't work. I mean, so it's <laughs> yeah. really, it just gives him heartburn. Yeah. But it's really funny um, because he can't end it. What about That's garlic like, bread? Did he try garlic bread? He's tried everything. Like he even had his neighbor is really good friends with him. She knows that he is a vampire. And they try to stake through the heart and it just bounces out. You know, it's just nothing's working. So it's. We did something similar in college where it was more like uh, a parks and recreation of the life of vampires, where they just have a documentary crew and doing the one on ones similar to the office. And uh, that show was called Life Sucks. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. No, this is, it's really funny. And and the na- our last name is uh, Vaughn Sucks, S-U-X. Von von suck your blood, like sucks your blood, but it's von sucks your blood is our last name. So sucks your blood. Really, von sucks your blood. Yeah. And I speak with a Romanian accent, which is really funny. It was really, that was actually fun for me because uh, I did pretty good. I guess they liked it. But um, yeah, the movie's coming out in a film festival in Denver next month, I think, or so. We'll be done maybe two months from now. Oh, so you're going to the premiere. I'll be going to the premiere red carpet event in Denver a couple a uh, month and a half from now or something like that. So, and then it'll make rounds, you know, sure. it's the university of uh, Colorado is the one used is the one that's doing it. So. It's, it's, all righty. So uh, all this work that you've been getting, were you able to land an agent after uh, your career? No, I'm still, I'm scared to do an agent. I'm scared because I just feel like uh, an agent wouldn't do what I'm doing. Not like I, I'm no. literally applying for hundreds of uh, in, within months and I'm not saying agents can't do that, but I know they have other clients. And so I think if I hit a big project, like something that just is life changing, which I may have done and I can't talk about, but yeah. if, if, if it turns up being a thing, then I'll probably get an agent. Um, Alrighty. So, I mean, I mean I'm, not, I'm not against it. I've just, I've just never come across to where, what would it been? How would it benefit me? What would they do that I'm not doing right now? Yeah. I know that feeling. You know, my, 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 I'm nothing against paying somebody for their services. I mean, if they deserve it, that's fine. But if I land a huge thing and I did it by myself, then why would I want to share that money with someone else? I mean, I mean, I want to do that. I, I do want an agent. I do want one, but I just don't feel like I deserve one right now. <laughs> I don't feel. I don't feel like one year, right? What's that? It's only been one year for you, yeah. It's only been a year, yeah. So it's like I I don't want to jump into an agent. I don't want to get in the water when there's no water in the pool. I don't want to jump in and be like, oh shit, there's no water. (laughs) 
No, nah, especially if you take a jump off the diving board and next yeah. thing, splat. And I, I do work a part-time job, um, and, which is, is amazing because they allow me to do what I want. So if I have an audition, if I have a project, they're like, okay, cool. No problem. I just have to give them a couple of days notice. It's not even a big deal to them. So I don't want to give that up. So until I, I can make it on my own without having to work a part-time job and say that I am an official, like super like actor to where I can, I can make a living just doing that. That's my goal right now. Uh, I'm, pretty close. All, I'm pretty close. I'm pretty close. I, I can't speak for all actors, but I have no doubt, uh, like, uh, especially like now, if they're listening, that that's the ultimate goal. We want to, we want to make a living doing this type of work. Doing that, yeah. Wake up, be an actor, voice acting, camera acting, whatever, and writing. Just do that. That would be the dream for me. Just to be able to, I don't even have to be super rich. I could just be, give me the money to where I can do that, make that happen comfortably every month. You know, you know what I, I mean? Look at my bank account and go, oh crap. If I buy a candy bar, I can't go to the shoot in Houston. You know what I mean? I know that um, feeling too of like on the edge. I don't know. Yeah, bro. Have you been able to uh, uh, get all your work like what through backstage or like actors access spaces? I'm, actually, like that? I'm a maniac. I'm a maniac. Uh, I, I'm on backstage. I see. Let's count it out. See, I'm on backstage. Obviously, IMDb Pro. Yeah. New York Casting Call. Casting Calls America. Now with Casting Calls America. It goes by location. So I've got five locations. I've got New York, California, Midwest, Minneapolis, and Texas. So it's like, and I know I, six because of faith. I have the faith ones too. They do like all the faith uh, type stuff. And so, and then I've got Casting Calls Ameri or Casting Call Club, which is mainly voice acting and uh, it's yeah. free. And then, um, I swear I'm missing one, but there's a lot. There's a lot. I have a lot of, I'm on a lot of things and I'm always on them all the time. I've got an Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. And now, believe it or not, I went against my own advice and I, I got TikTok now. So um, <laughs> I didn't think I would ever get TikTok. I didn't think I would ever get TikTok. So, but I'm on it. I'm on it. Yeah. I had to, I had to jump on that wagon too. And it's like, I just like to watch like silly videos, you know. I post I like, like can post. on TikTok literally for hours. I couldn't believe that. Where it's just like, I was like every fifteen seconds. Through, like, oh my god, I've been on yeah. the scene for an hour. And I'm and it's like I'm not even tired anymore. I haven't done anything all day, but I, I'm you know I know how to make this macaroni and cheese meal. You know, <laughs> I do like the the most that I like, and I'm sure TikTok is listening to me. What I really like is uh, how to create uh seedlings uh right from the branch of a tree or transplant a part of the yeah, tree yeah, to too, yeah. grow its roots and just have yeah. more tree a little like like gardening tips i'm really into like some yeah, not so much like cooking, but gardening garden. tips yeah i plant yeah. tomatoes every year uh granny they're called granny catrells and they're like these huge just monster tomatoes and we take the seeds every year I take the seeds and I replant them. So it's good to me is the coolest thing in the world, not just planting and making a plant, but taking the seeds from a plant that you planted last year and making another plant to me, that just blows my mind that I can do that. That to me, that's, what's cool. So I'm creating from creating and just keeps going. You know? I just saw like a, a video where they stuck a uh, copper and uh, they stuck it in the ground and uh, they had some sort of like electric experience and it caused the plant or the cabbage uh, to grow like uh, 10 times its normal size. Crazy. Uh, like little things like that, where you have actually like a greenhouse built where it actually blocks all the UV yeah. lights, but only allows the plant to absorb like sunlight, like filtered light where it's only the sunlight. And next thing you know, the thing produces like 10,000 cherry tom tomatoes the size of a cantaloupe. It's crazy. It's, it's addicting too. planting. Yeah. Is addicting. It really is. Cause we, I planted the bean, uh, green bean, the bean pole ones. The, we did the like oregano, uh, parsley. Oh, what else? I'm trying to think what else I did. Oh, you did a spice garden. Yeah. Like a little spice garden. And, um, and I don't know if we're getting a couple of them. 
but yeah, we did cherry tomatoes and things like that. But oh man, it, it like starts off like this little thing and then like sprouts. Oh my gosh. It's like taking over your backyard and you're just, I come home from work and I'll grab a couple tomatoes before I go in the house and I just pop them in my mouth. I mean, it tastes so much better. Way better. Like it's so right, better. it's right off the vine. It's naturally, you know, natural. But uh, I'm no getting chemical. into hydroponics now. That's awesome. It just looks that's amazing. Just, that's no. Like above my head. I just not with the, you know, you got to get the lights, you got to get the thing. And it's just like, seems like a lot. I, but I, I'm like, I'm a 3d printing guy. So when it comes to yeah, building you, all you these things, it, not me, not me. I, I'm just too super creative when it comes to that stuff. And if I could like, just like grow something and I got a plumbing background, so making it's not a biggie, I'll just hook it up literally to, uh, like our, uh, uh, what do you call those things on the roof where they actually drain all the water, the gutters? Yeah. 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 I'll just have a gutter system, just feed right into it. <laughs> That's actually really smart. Yeah. That's, that's, see, that's, uh, I can't do stuff like I can't put that stuff together. I, I'm one of those guys that you get the instructions. You go to like, you, you buy a table and, you, and it says you have to put it together. It says minimal, minimal. I'm like, okay, I can, I think I can figure this out. And then I'll get it and I'll look at the instructions and they're in a different language. <laughs> Somebody forgot to tell me that on the other side of the thing is the English. So, right. Once I figure that out, then I'm like, okay. And they got like a thousand directions and I'm cursing through the whole thing, you know? Oh, I never follow the directions or the instructions. I, I'm horrible with putting that stuff together. I'm the guy that will get some money so you can put it together for me. <laughs> I'm horrible with that. So. It, it's coming, you know, it's definitely, it's definitely coming where, you know, or you can just 3d print the things you want. And need. Oh yeah. That's what's insane is you ever heard of uh Warhammer? Sounds really familiar. It's a game. It's the yeah. little, mod- little models and they play. It's uh-huh. really super expensive. I mean, it's it, they're from the company's from Europe, and they're so expensive. And th- and those are just the models that are not painted. You still got to paint them and stuff. So a lot of people will just buy them already pre-done and everything. But I have a buddy of mine. I won't give his name because it's probably illegal. Um, he <laughs> he three D prints the. The, the figures and they look just like, I mean, there's no way to tell, you know, I can only imagine how much money he's saving, but we're, we're talking like, like four little models, like 50 bucks. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just for four little things, you know, it's a hobby, you know, like when you do, any, pretty much he, he, he can play Warhammer all day now because he's got all the best armies because he just makes them, you know, that is cool to me. That's cool to be able to do that. Sorry, Warhammer, but you know, just how that yeah, works. Yeah, uh, yeah. Sorry, Warhammer. Um, I mean, that's not my deal. I mean, but I think it's cool that he can do that. <laughs> I think it's cool. I don't know, like, if I have any, like, uh, I'm sure I got friends doing out there somewhere, like some form of piracy, but I can't even think of something oh, yeah. because I mean, no deal. Like, eventually, there'll be a. I don't even know what they'll do. It's kind of like, I don't know. Back when I was a kid, the big thing was recording off the radio with a little cassette tape. I used to I used to record everything to that. Well, right off of my VCR. Like yeah. I was, technically, I was a I was a pirate kid. I, I recorded oh. every I recorded all the cartoons on my VCR. Um, we still have them yeah. like, on on VHS. You know, so I was a pirate when I was a kid. And you get the, I miss the commercials. I mean, that's I never thought I'd miss commercials, but I miss the eighties commercials. And yeah, no, like I like I still have all of those, like some of those commercials where you had the kids on the it. block and they were singing, like on Fox, like Will yeah. be right back. Like the kid's name was yeah. Willie. That's so cool. That's cool. I miss Saturday. Whatever happened to Saturday morning cartoons, man? Kids are. I don't know, man. Like They're I don't know when the turn now. They don't care. It was probably 9-11 where everything just shifted, where it's like, yeah, we're just not going to, we're not going to, we're not going to, we're not going to give them any more entertainment. Life just got real. A lot of things don't exist anymore that it's hard for me to, it's like, I don't even want to, I can understand older people now that say, I don't want to live in this era because they don't have this, this, and that. Like simple things, things I never thought would be a, even be a thing like magazines, you know, you don't see too many magazines anymore. Um, you know, like mad magazines, I guess comic books are still going, but you know, just go online and look up everything. You don't you need magazines anymore. You well, know? We have NFTs now. So everything's becoming digital. It's like, Oh no, they're taking away paper, like books. Like you don't, people don't actually have physical books anymore. I, I love books. 
Do you have a favorite? God. That's a good question. Um, I do have a favorite and I can't remember the name of it, but I know what it's about. It's about the, it was a, a guy, I read it a couple of times. So good. His true story. This guy did a story, showed him when he got addicted to steroids. So he was a skinny, he's from New York. He, he used to ride the subway. He used to get picked on all the time. And he got into the gym. He was super smart. He got like a full ride scholarship to like Yale or Harvard or some, some crazy thing. And he actually went against it and decided to move to Los Angeles, take all his college money his dad saved up for him and use it for a gym membership at Gold's Gym in California. Met a bunch of guys that did steroids. He did steroids. Within five years, this skinny little kid was doing competition bodybuilding. and But he talks about his, his journey and about the bad things. And then eventually at the very end, he decides to be a personal trainer and get rid of the steroids and stuff. But anyway, it was such a good book. So it's a biography. Yeah. Or it's a biography. Yeah. I can't remember the name of it. Gosh. Do you remember his name? I don't. I'd have to do some research. I'll have to let you know. <laughs> it's a really good book, though. Uh, to um, anybody tuning in on the podcast, we'll get back to you on that fact. <laughs> yeah, it's such a good book. And I, I want to say I, I don't have it physically, but I, I remember researching and I actually found it because I want to get it again. I'm going to get back with you. It's a super good book. But uh, super educational if you're into bodybuilding. And I was at the time and I was considering steroids and things. And I'm so glad I read that because of some of the stuff he talked about and people dying at young ages just from like heart attacks. And they'd be in perfect shape and just die. Really? Really just die. Their heart would just stop because of all the steroids and stuff they were doing. Bodybuilders are the most unhealthiest people with to their body they abuse their body so much when it comes to you know like supplements and and just stuff the that image. They do. yeah just to look good and they know that it shortens their life but they don't care that just that blows my mind they would rather rather look good for a short amount of time than just look regular for a long time i so guess weird. so weird but it's probably I a form out. of idolatry you know well, it's probably worse now than ever with TikTok. People so worry so much about how they look and, you know, they have to show yeah. their ass. Show, oh, look, look at my ass, my boobs and all these other, I mean, it's like, it's crazy how it's a father's nightmare. I'm glad my daughters grew up before TikTok. <laughs> oh my God. Do they have uh, any military aspirations or acting aspirations or anything like that? My son was in the Air Force for four years as a surgery technician, got out. Now he's like a traveling medical person making crazy money. My other kids uh, did not get into the military. My daughter, I just had a second grandkid from her. She's doing great. She works at like Eyeglass World or something. She has a great husband. They have a great life. I'm really happy for them. My other daughter is into crystals and stuff. She does like readings and she's really deep into that and she has it she has a tiktok channel and i can't i don't know what it is offhand but i'm not into that but she's really into that and then uh my other son i think he wants to be an actor but i don't know uh he emulates me a lot which is i don't know if that's always a good thing <laughs> well, i gotta say, like Dwayne, i gotta say like uh i i could never have guessed that you're even a grandfather let alone like a, a dad with kids out of high school you know you look you do. You look, you don't even look 50 years old. Thank you so much. I, I don't know. My grandfather's 98. My great grandmother was over hundred. I mean, I think it's, it's wow. definitely. Yeah. My, my uh, Portuguese background, my, my real name is, uh, I'm not okay. I'm okay with saying it is uh, Michael uh, Chavez. So I'm actually Spanish. Um. Dwayne Michaels was, is my middle, my middle name is Dwayne. So I took my middle name and my first name and just flop, flop them like that. All right. So, just yeah. for like theatrical reasons, just to kind of like, or. Well, uh, some personal reasons, I'm not really a big fan of my dad and I'm a junior. So that kind of separates me from him. Sure. I think that that's the big one. And then uh, I just like the way it sounds. I think, I think when you have your, unless you have just the coolest name on the planet, like, uh, Sean Michaels. Papadora or something. Um, <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> yeah, really cool last name or something that really sounds good in film, then that's fine. 
I just think my name just sounded maybe because I had it my whole life. I just felt like it was like, and I looked up my name. My I actually looked at my first and last name, and there was like a gazillion of them. Sure, there's only one Dwayne Michaels on on IMDb, and that's me. Um, there is a guy called Dwayne Michaels, but he spells Michaels weird, and he's European. I think he's dead. He was like a writer or something. But I'm the only one, so it's a lot easier to find me that way too. So I think I thought that would be a good advantage to have as well. So well, how'd you hear about, you know, this entire universe? Like, uh, you had, you come from a military background. Uh, what'd you do for like, you know, uh, from your military background, all the way up <laughs> into your acting career? I got, my life's like Forrest Gump in, in a lot of ways, but I was born in Lake Tahoe, California. I grew up there until I was about 14. My parents got divorced. And then once that's pretty much when my life started getting crazy, my parents got divorced and I started living with different family members. I was the only child lived with different family members. My mom and my dad just bouncing back around a lot, moving all over California and all over. I went to Colorado went to Oklahoma, just seeing the world and back. But, uh, I was kind of a bad kid growing up. I missed school a lot. I was skateboarding a lot. And, and just cause you're a skateboarder doesn't mean you're a hoodlum. Um, but back then I was a little hoodlum with a skateboard and I missed so much school that they put me in night school. And, um, and I'll try to make this story somewhat short cause it can be long, but it's all right. this guy came to our night school and he was a manager for a famous singer. And he said, uh, the famous singer is going to be performing. I lived in Reno, Nevada at the time. And he's like, um, hotel, Bally's hotel and casino. They're going to be, he's going to be performing for the next three days. Um, he wants to do some charity work because he was like, a, he was a troubled kid as, as a youth as well. And so they divided us up our night school class three nights. I had to wear my dad's jacket and okay. tie too big, but it, I wore it because he had to for the show. But after the show was over, uh, we got to meet this guy. And, you know, I, I didn't even know who he was at the time. I just thought he was just, you know, was, I knew, I've heard a couple of his songs. I was like, whatever, he's just some old guy. But his name was uh, Frank Sinatra. And so uh, Frank Sinatra pulled us aside and talked to us individually and asked us what our problems were. And I had met, I think I met a couple other people. I don't know if Sammy Davis Jr. was there. There's other people that were famous at the time, Wayne. It wasn't Wayne Newton. And uh, I didn't know these people were, you know. And I just remember Frank Sinatra had had really fat fingers. He remember he had big hands, fat fingers, and he had rings all over his fingers. And I, that really stuck with me. But he gave me this long speech about his life. And he talked about, you know, I need to straighten up. And, you know, life sometimes gives you a, a, you get a bad luck from life, but you just got to bounce back and give me this big, speech and i never really had a father figure at the time my dad was kind of a loser so um i saw him as like a father figure and i looked up to him and so i kind of decided to be good at that point um and i moved to colorado and so if i guess if it wasn't for frank sinatra i would still have been a skateboarding hoodlum but <laughs> i think i improved after that so, so that was directly from the mouth of frank sinatra himself yes oh my yeah. god yeah. Yeah. I didn't know. And I, it was so funny because I didn't even know who this guy was. Um, I knew, I, I think I, I heard like in New York, New York, the song, but at the, at a kid, you know, at that kid, I didn't know, I didn't care about this guy. And back then you didn't have internet and all that stuff. So I couldn't really research this guy so much, but I really looked up to him after that. And I started watching his movies, listen to his music. And then now I'm thinking, my God, that was Frank Sinatra. What the hell? I wish I, I would have known back then what I was getting my, you know, doing, but Dude, that's yeah. like, I, who could say like, you know, they met Frank Sinatra, changed my life. I straightened everything out. And like, how old were you then? I uh, was, I believe it was in the 80s. So I, I want to say it was like, I want to say 89. So it's in the I was, God, not 89. I think it was 87, 88. I don't know. I was about 13, 14 years old. Welcome to Happy Corner. This project strives to make safe housing areas for stray cats at an affordable price. It's so easy to put together that even your children could have fun making one. Help keep cats and other animals safe with their own little happy corner homes. You can help this project become a reality by donating to the GoFundMe page. Happy corner homes are a great way to show those animals in need, it's okay to be happy.
I was like, I was born in 87. So, uh, yeah. Frank Sinatra, like yeah. he must've been like, uh, maybe 70 years old around that time. Yeah. The name of this, it was called the man and his music tour. And it was his last, supposedly his last tour. And it was at Reno's hotel. Somebody could do some research, I'm sure, and figure it out. But it was uh, Reno, Nevada, Bally's Hotel and Casino, the Grand Bally's Hotel and Casino. And yeah, I was around around 87, 88, around there, around that time. So pretty cool stuff. Um, yeah, and ever since then, I started, I was doing a lot better. Um, I did eighth grade three times. Um, I had missed so much school from just not going. And so when I moved to Colorado with my mother, Colorado Springs, then I started going to school and that's when my life started getting better, you know, with my school and whatnot, but I was older. I was always older than everybody, which sucked. So So you were getting held back a lot. I got held back twice because of just lack of going to school. I mean, they basically were like, you missed so much school this year that it'd be pointless for you to go. So we are going to start again next year. I graduated high school when I was 20. No, no kidding, man. Wow. Yeah. I was, yeah. I joined high school. I mean, I graduated high school. I didn't really graduate, graduate. So my class graduated. I was like a few credits short and I dropped out and I joined a radio station. I was a radio DJ for three years uh, at a radio station. I was Michael- a lot of DJs in the AFC, man. Yeah. I was, a, I was, D, I was Michael McCoy. I was playing all your favorites in a better variety, 90 out of him for like three years. Um, and then I, you know, life gets in the way. I had a child at a young age. I needed medical insurance. I decided to join the military. You know, that's basically how that life went. That's exactly how I became an actor. I needed medical insurance. So I went to college. And that's something. Yeah. Like, like, you know, a lot of people already know my story, you know, like I've been doing this for a minute. So like, you know, I had a decent ongoing pot- potential professional career in New York City construction, got hurt, freak accident. I had to get health insurance and go and uh, do my first like theatrical production right after orthoscopic surgery on my shoulder. The next thing you know, you're producing a film festival 15 years later. Isn't that crazy? It's so crazy. I still can't believe I'm acting. You know, I was I got I got really, really lucky. I decided to be an actor. And I landed a feature film with a bunch of amazing actors that are well known in the business. And it just, they say the most important thing is who you know. And this is so true because ever since I did that one movie, it's just everyone's just, it's fallen in line. And uh, Michael, Mike Kimmel was my sidekick in the movie and you could look him up on imdb he wrote for the tonight show for like 16 17 years he's been he's been a SAG member for 20 30 years or something um some amazing people i worked with the director shanalia palmer she's she's done a lot of you know directing and stuff walking dead uh i mean there's just so many if you look her up as well shanalia palmer and she's done directed a lot of a lot of big stuff. And so I got, I fell into this movie with her and him and a lady. Um, her name is uh, Ruth Peebles, who I used to watch on Matlock as a kid, the TV show. So you get all these great famous people and then you throw me in the mix. And of course I'm going <laughs> to, I mean, all the, I soaked them up like a sponge. Oh my gosh. Learning, you know, the acting techniques, how to memorize things, how to just, it's amazing. I got so lucky to fall into this, the lap of this movie. And it's called Promised Land. It's still in post-production right now. It's trying to find a home right now. It could land on Netflix. We'll see. It's still, it's all over the place right now. It's oh yeah, totally- the recent names attached to that, you know, picture, Promised Land, that actually, you know, it sounds actually, uh, doesn't, I don't want to say like a religious movie, but it does sound like uh, it was a, uh, a journey of a film where you had to overcome like strong adversity. Yeah, well, it ended, it ended, with basically they made the movie to sell as a series. So it doesn't end with an ending and, you know, it's like a what if thing. And so it's a, it's more of a political movie. And I play the bad guy, which is kind of neat. You know, when I joined, when I got out of the military, I became a police officer. I was a police officer for almost 17 years and retired. 
but I've always played this good guy role in real life, being the military police officer. I guess you could say a dad, you know, I've always been this good guy. And then I, so it's kind of fun playing a bad guy. It's kind of, I have a lot to draw on being a former police officer <laughs> also, you know, so. I'm, yeah, I'm happy for you, Dwayne. Like this is Thank really you. like, I'm I'm still taken aback where you actually got to you ever you know dude like have you ever uh, heard of this book called the right words at the right time? No, it's an outstanding book. Um, I'll write I'll write it down here. I see the right book. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's by uh, Marcy Tom Thomas or Thompson, and I think I've talked spoken about this before, but I just you know I, I read the book and it's uh, basically uh, short little little short stories. Um, woman Marcy she met a couple of hundred well-known, whether celebrity athletes, uh, politicians, uh, she wanted to just know like, uh, just one thing that these guys all had in common, like, uh, were there ever, uh, words at the right time that actually, uh, were said to you that literally just carried you, uh, and stuck with you to actually get to the point where you are right now. And, uh, I remember asking the same question to, uh, um, I was on film set one time, you know, just started acting. Uh, uh, this movie was called Collar. Um, they were doing reshoots. And uh, Richard Roundtree, Rebecca De Mornay, and Tom Sizemore got casted to kind of like maybe enhance the film a little bit. But uh, I was asked by the AD, it's like, hey, kid, um, could you uh, 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 read? Like, we heard you're an actor, yada, yada. And like, what do you mean read? I just had to warm up uh, Richard Roundtree, like get him off book, get him ready to get into the prep. So I'm kind of, I'm, I'm reading with him. Mm -hmm. And I asked him the same question, like, uh, like once upon a time, was there ever any words at the right time that, you know, stuck with you to carry you throughout your career? And uh, he did tell me a story on how he met Bill Cosby, but I'm, but I'm curious, Dwayne, like, uh, like, were there ever any words given to you that were the right words at the right time that are pretty much like maybe sticking with you over the past year? Just uh, I remember his encouraging uh, Frank Sinatra's encouraging words about uh, life basically sucks and uh, you just got to fight back. You just got you can't curl up in a corner and let it kick your ass. You get your get up and and go for what you what it is that you want to do. Go for it type thing. You know, he talked about how his life kind of beat him up. And I just it really resonated with me because at the time at that time, my life was beating me up. You know, my dad was without getting into too much detail, but my dad was just the, his lifestyle wasn't, uh, he wasn't a good dad at the time. So I wasn't getting a good father figure. Uh, I was living with my stepmom. Uh, and she wasn't really, she was in the same boat. My mother was trying to make something of her life by joining the military. So it was really on my own at that point. And, uh, until everybody, until I got older, but life was kicking me in the ass. And so when he said that, it really kind of was like, wow, yeah, and this guy knows what he's talking about, you know? Um, and forget the fact that he was Frank Sinatra. I didn't, like I said, I didn't even really think about it like that because I didn't really know him who, who he was too much. And, uh, and everybody, when I tell them the story, they freak out like, Oh my God, that's Frank Sinatra. You know what I mean? And, and now I get it. I'm older. I understand who he is. So I get it now, but back then I didn't get it to me. He was just this nice old guy that was giving me these great words of, of wisdom and it, I followed what he said and it just, it worked out for me. So, um, yeah, just the fact that he was encouraging and, and basically I related with him, I guess his, his youth was tough as well. And so I think I said, yeah, he's like me, you know? So I don't know. It, it's, it's just, it's insane that I'm even having this conversation. The fact that I'm, I'm act, I still hits me every now and then that I'm doing, I'm acting. I'm actually doing what these things, you know, never thought I would actually do at this age. So it's never too late to become an actor, you know, like you got to, Oh yeah. Never, never. It's you never, bring, you, bring a, you bring experience and a dynamic, you know, that separates you from the other guy who didn't get cast. You know, I've got a lot of life. I think life experience has to be one of the best educations when it comes to a lot of jobs, not just acting, but a lot of things in life can be solved with good life experience. Um, and it could be just the opposite. You could have a bad life with bad life experience as well. So it just depends on your life experience. I was lucky, very lucky to have an amazing mother uh, who raised me by herself, did a great job, taught me, you know, it's hard for a woman to teach a guy how to be a man. Um, 
And so she did the best she could. She did an amazing job. And then, uh, you know, just having a lot of good father figures in my life. I think that's, that's, you don't need a father. You need father figures in your life sure. to direct you in the right path or they can read, they can direct you in the wrong path too. So absolutely, uh, father figures are really important for a boy. I think it's important to have that, you know, they always say, Oh, there's not enough fathers in the homes and stuff. That is true. Maybe, but I think that could be made up by having really amazing father figures in your community. Um, to help the young men of them, you know, nowadays to direct them how to be a man and a woman can teach uh, boys a lot of things, but it is really hard for a woman to teach a, a boy how to be in a certain way. You know, yeah. so I was very lucky to have those father figures in my life. Frank Sinatra just happened to be one of them. So, which is really cool. Really cool. Cool. More cool now than then, because then, like I said, I didn't even realize <laughs> what I was, what I fell into. Was that just one day, one afternoon? Just one evening. It mm -hmm. was, uh, we went to a show, we watched the show. You get two drinks. Of course, I had like two Shirley Temples because I thought it was cool. And uh, my guy. Yeah, two Shirley Temples. And then wearing an oversized jacket, oversized tie. I look like I'm wearing daddy suit, which I was. And then they direct us behind to meet everybody. And then to me, it was, it was just like, oh, this is kind of cool. I get to see a free show, free meal. We have a new bunch of music I don't like. Um, Come on. I didn't like it. I didn't like it at the time. I mean, I didn't know what I was listening to. Yeah. All right. I like it now. Sure. You get a picture. I was like, New York, New York. I'm like, oh, geez. You know, what's this? Yeah. What's this about? <laughs> <laughs> that is kind of, that is kind of funny, man. But no, I, I get it. like when you're a kid, you're not, you're not into that. No, I wasn't. And you know, they didn't, have, they didn't have internet and stuff back then. So you couldn't really, you know, like, if you wanted to hear music like that, you had to go to the library, you know, or rent rent a record or something. I mean, or you have to listen to the oldie station. Sure. Um, but you didn't want to do that as a kid. You know, I was listening to back then. I think I was really into like punk rock music and stuff. So I was listening to the Ramones and uh, Motley Crue, guys like that. No effects, you know, no effects. And oh, yeah, I love, of course, you know, you like the hair bands, you know, Rat and... <laughs> And Molly Crew and uh, Accept. I don't know if you know who that is. I don't know Accept. No. Um, Guns and Roses. Guns and know. Roses. Yeah. Absolutely. Guns and Roses came out around that same year, I think. So whatever year that album came out is the year I met Frank Sinatra. So whatever that year is, so we could research it that way. Because um, I remember Welcome to the Jungle came out around that time, and I was like, "Whoa, what is this? This is amazing." It's here's cool. a, here's a fact for you because i'm a big movie buff and i'm sure you are too um something the movie deadpool sure uh with uh clint eastwood oh and he was a cop yes okay he was like the unofficial dirty harry in that movie right right right, 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 right. character but he was basically dirty harry because it was in yeah. san francisco anyway there's a scene in the movie jim carrey played the bad guy I gotta, I gotta, like, I've only, like, yeah, it's, it's crazy. I only saw the trailer. I, I didn't actually watch Deadpool. So he played a serious role. His first movie. I think it, I want to say it was Jim Carrey's first movie. I, I know he's in some sort of vampire movie when he was in high school. Like, uh, he played a, the lead singer of this band. And the whole story, they were trying to kill him or something. But anyway, his bandmates met him at a funeral. And the bandmates were, it was Guns N' Roses. So oh, if you watch, if you watch the movie, the Guns N' Roses are at the funeral and, and Slash has got his big hat on and everything. Um, Deadpool. I want to see it. first movie. Was it Deadpool, Deadpool? Deadpool. Must have been two words, huh? It's probably two words. It was about, basically it was about a pool that you would put. The Deadpool. Out. Yes. The Deadpool. The Deadpool. Okay. 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 Liam Neeson was in it. Oh, wow. Yeah. I think he played the director. I pay, oh. He played uh, Peter Swan, David Hunt. Let me see. You're right. He, he, Jim Carrey was uh, James Carrey, and uh, he played Johnny Squares. 
Yeah, he played the lead singer of the band. I want to say he was the that was his first movie. No kidding. Yeah, Guns N' Roses made the guest I appearance funeral. Yeah, it was definitely it was definitely early days. Like, uh, yeah, he might have actually uh, it could have been his first because. I remember looking up Jim Carrey's full resume and I remember like he was this like a uh, vampire young kid uh, before he even did. Uh, what was that movie? Like Earth Girls Are Easy, like early, early times, way before Ace Ventura, way before. Oh, yeah. This is way before. Oh, wow. No, I'm going to have to I'm going to have to watch this. How come you didn't tell me about this movie? You told me that your favorite movie was uh, uh, Weird Science and Alien. Like That's why? True. Aliens with an S. All right, first aliens, one alien one. Alien one, alien is good. It's amazing, of course, but aliens was better. That was number two. Number two, aliens would actually go down to the planet and fight um the aliens. You get to see a bunch of aliens. And it's not like the first movie, Alien, is just drags on. You know, they have they have jump scares the whole movie. It's like, just show me the damn alien. And uh, in the movie yeah. Alien, just you got what you wanted. It's just a freaking armada of these aliens, and you got uh, what's his name is in it, uh, Bill. Um, Let me take a uh, look. From Twister, from Weird Science, from you know, I know yeah. I, <clears throat> um, I saw this one with the little girl. Yeah, the one with the little girl, and of yeah, course, she's she stranded for a while. Weaver, of course, of course, Sigourney Sigourney Weaver. Sigourney Weaver. She's, she's the boss, man. She's she's a badass. Oh, it's Bill she's Paxton. Still a I know he passed away not too long ago. I, he actually, his family's suing in the hospital. Oh, you're kidding me? No, it's a medical. It was a medical mal- malpractice. No, that's how he died. Yeah, I, they actually may be over. They may have won. He had he had some kind of surgery. Uh, it wasn't like a major thing, and they messed up. And so he died from medical malpractice. Of course, my opinion only, I don't want to get in trouble with like, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I'm pretty sure they messed up and they're suing the hospital for it, which is sucks. Cause he's such an amazing actor. Can you say, can you remember his first movie? It, it wasn't weird science. Was it? No. Before that? I want to say it was Terminator. Bill Paxton. Yeah. Terminator. Wait a yeah, minute. I think he, I think he was the one that got his heart ripped out. Well, oh, very- like one of the gang kids. Yeah, I think he was one of the gang kids. Oh, you're kidding me! <laughs> I am a movie. I haven't I, seen. I, I have so much stupid movie knowledge. Well, these are the making of the Terminator. Uh, he was in. Um, that was back in 1984. He played himself. Or just self, predator, the trespass, the making of alien, nineteen ninety two. Unless it was, uh, it might. I don't know if it was, it could be uncredited, but it looks like back in like the early eighties, he didn't get credit for the Terminator if he was in it. Yeah, he was one of the punk. He was one of the punk dudes. I want to say the leather jacket that the Terminator wore, the very first one when he showed up naked, was the one Bill Paxton was wearing. I just don't see him and Arnold Schwarzenegger kind of like filling out. The I same know, game, I know? know, but I swear, I kid you not. I believe it was him. I be- no, I believe you. And if I really actually paid attention and watched Terminator again, because I haven't seen the original Terminator yeah, yeah. other than what it was on TV since like Blockbuster back in like uh, 1996, you know, mm-hmm. when I, you just watch it on VHS and you can un like unrated, just watch the movie, you know, we just watched, uh, I just watched a on Shutter. I like to watch old crappy B movie horror flicks, and <laughs> he was in it. It may have been that could have been his first movie too, but it had had three people from the movie Aliens in it. So the there were all three of them together in this movie. It was him. It was the guy that plays the robot Bishop guy. Yeah, all right. And it was the girl from Aliens too, the Hispanic girl that was all buffed out. Yeah, He's like, girl. have you ever been uh, confused for a, wo- a woman? He goes, she's like, no, have you? Um, she was in it. Those I remember three, it. Her name is uh, Jeanette Goldstein. Yeah, them three were in it. And it was a B movie about vampires. And there was a couple other big stars in it too. I was like, oh my God. 
See, I mean, you can't say no in the early days to any type of film because, A, you don't know where it's going to go. You need the reps. And it, it is a lot of fun. Like, uh, I, I got to admit, like, I, I miss enjoying uh, working with actors and doing a movie. Not going to lie. You know, I haven't really done, a, like, something to, like, you know, like really just enjoy, enjoy the ride and have fun and have fun making a movie. You know, these guys, it definitely shows in their work. And oh, yeah. uh, I, like, I haven't seen you on screen, big or small yet, but I, I, I'm really looking forward to seeing like what you've accomplished so far. I can't wait. It's like all I, I, I see it as like all my projects are like balloons in the air with helium and they're all, I want to take the little thing and shoot them out of the air and finally, but I'm just being patient. It's really tough because I have a bunch of stuff I've completed. Just 10 projects just float around and they're all waiting to land. So, and then the meantime, I just, I just keep working. I just keep and working. That's outstanding though. Like, uh, do you ever find yourself in a compromised situation where you're just not, something ain't clicking while you're on set? Not yet. Um, that's a good question, but no, not yet. I mean, I haven't, I don't think I've experienced it enough. I'm sure that'll happen. Well, what kind of like uh, you mentioned some training before, like uh, was there any certain techniques that you kind of got into that was really working for you? Uh, you're talking about acting techniques type thing? Yeah. Like how'd you get your, uh, you know, kind of like get your feet wet? Oh, I, uh, I decided to be in it. Well, I've always wanted to be an entertainer. I've always been an entertainer as a kid. We always like reenacted stuff and I was just always an entertaining. I started, I did stand up comedy for several years and I traveled around did stand up comedy for a while. And I liked the feeling of entertaining, you know, it's kind of like a drug, you know? Yeah. And I read a story I, somewhere. I want to say time or life magazine or th those exist anymore. I don't know, but it was something, some article where they said that the biggest fears in people's lives, the top three, I can't remember the third one, but one of the number two was speaking to large crowds um, actually, no, that was number one. Number one was speaking to large crowds. Number two was death. So you would rather be in the box than given the eulogy, which I always thought, I always thought that was really interesting. Oh, so the fact that I'm able to conquer that biggest fear of most people was amazing. So I, I, I love the feeling of people laughing at my jokes and things, you know, even the hecklers, it was so much fun. So Acting is very similar to that, except for obviously you get to, you get to redo it. So if you mess up, you just redo it again, you know? Oh, so and you like, haven't tried like theater yet. Theater. Did you try any theater yet? I did. I've done, I did a theater show. We did six shows. It was called the, um, the brothers Grimm spectacular And I played three characters. I played the King I played, no, I played four characters. I played the king. I played Rumpelstiltskin. <laughs> I, I played the dwarf and I played Magic Mirror. So they went through all these different, in like an hour show, they went, we went through all these different characters and I had to keep switching, you know, switching costumes. It, it was really, I tell you, theater will make you an amazing actor because you, oh, yeah, you got to do it. You know, it's so much fun. If you're going to be an actor, I definitely recommend doing at least one or two theaters. It's so much harder in a different ways um, because you can't mess up, you know, your life. Oh, so yeah. You, know, you have to improvise. You have to play it off, you know. Okay. That's when a lot of techniques do come into play when you're that, you know, experienced. Um, there was a really – I don't know who actually got credit for the quote, but uh, something I stumbled across is that um, as an actor, uh, it was said that uh, uh, movies – will make you famous television will make you rich but theater will make you good yes you know this is so true theater if anybody's thinking about being an actor i would recommend theater first because you really you learn so much from it, it, a lot of it it's memorization is such a big thing i i have a crappy time memorizing lines I have a technique now that I learned from other people that I, I use, but it's still difficult. I still, I need a couple extra more days than most people because, you know, um, but it'll help you with your memorization so much because in theater, you start off the first week you practice, 
you, you kind of know your lines. You have your lines in front of you. The second week, they want you to take the lines away from you. And now you've got to remember, but you can refer back to them if you need to. And okay. then like, yeah. And then the third and fourth week, you're, you you can not touch them. You've yeah. got to know. Them. So you're on a deadline. So it forces you to really memorize. And I tell you what, you can really act really well when you have your lines memorized. Oh, Trying yeah. to act and remember your lines at the same time really throws you, you know, it makes you all jacked up. You're like, eh. I mean, like, it's so it's so connected to your body and your tempo and your pacing, where like if you start doing different motions, um, you're starting to experience a totally different. Uh, frame of mind and the next thing you know you get kind of caught up in that emotional state and then next thing you know you don't remember your line yeah you, and you'll you, well you'll i've been like locked landlocked just like literally like just went yeah like I, yeah. I studied these lines for like a week straight like nine and eight hours of the day just memorizing and listening to it and just i thought man i have this down now you gotta walk you know and i get on stage and they're like okay my line's coming up i'm ready I actually know what my first word is. And then I go. Yeah. Okay. Isn't that, Maybe it's kind of, isn't that weird though? Give me a push line. Uh, how are you? Oh yeah. How are you to. <laughs> oh crap. I don't know yeah. any of it, but it's in there. That's like the worst thing when it's in your brain and you can't get it to come out of your mouth. It's just like, I know it's there. You can overstudy also so you just gotta i think theater just helps you become a better actor a lot of aspects you know memorization you know your acting is physical and this is something i've learned from people who have taught me uh my some of my acting stuff is acting is physical there's a there's a bunch of famous actors that they'd be in movies and they'd only have like one or two lines but they'd be in the scene for a good two minutes and they would uh michael kane it was a good he, Michael King got upset one time because when he first started acting, he had like two lines and then he's in it for five minutes and they're like, cut, cut, cut. What's going on, Michael? Michael's like, what? I already said my lines. And the director's like, yeah, but you're still in the scene. You're, you're what you do with your, your face and your expressions and the way you react to him talking, that's acting. So you actually are in the scene. You're acting for five minutes, not just your lines, but you're actually acting the entire time you're in the scene. So it makes you think you have to like react in real life. You wouldn't be just sitting there going. No, you're in tune with the circumstance, the situation, the whole thing. You're it's in super, it. super important to react physically, to know what you look like, to look yourself in the mirror and make faces. I used to do that all the time. It's such a good technique. To, you know, you should know what you look like when you make certain faces, you know, to know your own body like that. You know, yeah. about like the rock when he does the, the eyebrow. eyebrow. Yeah. He probably was in the mirror for hours practicing that when he was younger. Um, but now he knows exactly what he looks like. Like, my God, there's so many funny comedians that are physical, just make certain faces and you just start cracking up because the way they react, you know? Sure. Um, so yeah, physical, the physicality of theater is really teaches you a lot of physicality when it comes to like emotions and the way you look and how you react to certain things. Uh, people catch on to that. So I think that's such a good thing to learn before you do like TV or movie. Yeah. Bad actors are just people that don't know what to do with themselves. Not this has nothing to do with their lines, just yeah. how they, how they present those lines and how they make their faces with it and how they react with their body. That's what the most important thing is. It's more believable when you're reacting a certain way, you know, it's like a visual harmonious orchestration of the scene. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. It's not just your word. No. Um, and even if you, something you've got to remember is even if you have one or two lines in a, in a, in a project, because of those lines, the movie can move forward. So yeah. without you presenting those, those just one sentence, that one sentence is so important to move the movie forward. So yeah, you may only have one or two lines, but that is such an important thing that you're, a, you're an important person in the, in the production because you're making it progress. So anybody that, that gets upset, they only have a few lines. Just think about that. You know, you're, if you wouldn't have said those lines, the movie cannot progress further. Um, Samuel Jackson, you know, when he did the McDonald or the McDowell scene in uh, coming, oh, to yeah, coming to America, we're only, only there for I mean, how, 
portion like of the movie. One minute. But it made such an impact with people. It made such an important thing. And it was such an important part of the movie because he was able to show his self-defense techniques and that he was a tough guy. And it, it made it such an important impact in the movie. It was a turning point. And so, yeah, it doesn't matter if you get one line or 20 lines. Every yeah. line is so important. Um, and I have a lot of those little lines that I've done, but now I'm starting to progress into bigger lines. But I still appreciate those those smaller lines, too. They add up. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I get to be on screen, so I'm excited. That too, definitely. Uh, I'd say it's validating where you can kind of take a look at your work and learn from it. Because, uh, like, sure. I've learned I've learned more from watching myself. Like being a football player and having that background, where you can kind of see where maybe you made a mistake or try to remember exactly uh, what you were going through and maybe how you could have just made a little change. You know, little little things like that. It, it's it's. This world is crazy. The acting world is crazy. Mentally, it's if you have mental issues, then you belong as an actor too. Because oh, you know, sign me up. It helps with depression, anxiety. You know, expressing yourself. I agree. I do. Yeah, I, I can. I can really. I can get behind that. It personally helps me. The only problem is I'm too hard on myself. You know. Well, I mean, if you're striving for excellence, there's no, honestly, there's, um, there, there, there's no dishonor in that, as you would say, you know, there's, there's not because, uh, uh, you know, your potential, you know, your creativity, you've already wrote, written two scripts, you know, you're, you're, you're actually enjoying this. My only suggestion would be is to find somebody, uh, you know, like how Rocky had Mick in his corner. And then the, with those two guys together, somebody in your life to just really, um, be that coach to kind of just like maybe stretch you out a little bit. Cause uh, you got 10, like you got 10 rounds like underneath you. That's really good. Like if you were able to level up and just kind of uh, like pretty much second level, level two, where you have full ownership and control over that first year of work and be able to expand in different directions. That's probably your next step. Yeah. It, it, I think the hardest, I made a mistake of, and this is just my personality. I made the mistake of, on IMDb Pro, uh, do you have an IMDb Pro? I do. So if you look at the, I, if you have IMDb Pro, and I think you can do it with just IMDb, but you can go on IMDb Pro and look at any actor you ever thought about. Uh, I'm actually on there, which is hilarious. I'm like amongst all these people. And just look up, I don't know, random. Just think of the first actor that comes to your mind. Go on IMDb Pro and then you scroll down and it has a number. And it, what it does is that number tells you up or down your popularity. Oh, that, yeah. 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 And yeah. so big mistake. They shouldn't have made that because I am so watching it all the time. So um, <laughs> major, the, the normal person, and I just say normal uh, loosely, if someone becomes an actor, if you're just doing a couple of projects, your number is going to start out around anywhere from 10 to 20 million, obviously. Um, yeah. You know, you're, yeah. rank, you're trying to get, you're trying to rank, you know, yeah, and it goes every Monday and it, it changes every Monday, every Monday it changes up or down. And then it's kind of neat because it shows you, you know, people are looking for you. People are, it's an algorithm that goes on, you know, it, it goes by how many people research you and things like that. So anyway, my number started out at 300,000. So I was like, holy crap, you know? That was a big mistake. I wish it would have started in the millions because now I'm like, I watch it. So then it went, my best number went to 90,000. Sure. Like, sure. It, it just kept going up and I'm like, Oh yeah, I'm almost there. You know, I'm look at me. I'm going to be, you know, and I, I only had like one or two projects at the time. I'm like, why am I getting this attention? You know, I, I don't get, yes. but the problem is, is now it's gone. I've done more than I've ever done before ever as an actor. And now it's starting to go down. And I'm thinking it plays with your psyche. You're like, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> like, oh no, am I, I'm not auditioning enough. Dude, I'm auditioning so much. It's ridiculous. So it, it, I wish I wouldn't even known about this number because now I, every Monday I check it and it goes up or down and, oh God, it's just, it's pain in the ass. Uh, it's almost honestly like, uh, I think data like that might influence a little bit of a decision. Maybe, maybe. May, may, people may be like, oh, why has he got such a low number? 
maybe he's making, you know, but I don't think that's, that's not going to happen. So Pascal, what's his name? Pascal, the new guy that's doing a lot, the Mandalorian. Oh, that, yeah. He has five names. Amazing. I mean, the guy's making so many waves right now. If you look up on IMDb Pro, he's number one. He's got his rank is one. Oh, well, The Last of Us really probably put him ahead of everybody. Oh, yeah. Well, then you got The Mandalorian's coming up soon. Oh, so um, we're on episode three. Oh, yeah. It comes out Perfect. every Wednesday. Amazing. Amazing. No, I mean, so, he was right for the character and like his work on Game of great. Thrones. Really he's good. Great. Oh, yeah, with Game of Thrones. But yeah, his numbers, he's number one. But I look back, you can look back in history and see where he started. And he started around where I started. So then it starts really blowing my mind. I'm thinking, oh my God, if he started around my number, if I keep going, maybe just maybe, you know, but I kind of wish I didn't know about that number because now I'm cursed. Now I check it all the damn time. But well, I guess like, uh, before we wrap things up, you know, uh, uh, are you able to talk maybe just a little bit about, um, the, your creativity side on the two films that you may want to produce one day? Sure. Sure. So, um, I've got, I have two films, um, that I am going, I am going to be making one, at least one of them this year, for sure. The second, the first one, um, that I came up with, is called check. I think that's what we originally decided. It started out as the check, the receipt, the ticket, but we're going to call it check with exclamation points. And it's just simply, basically it's a short film, man and woman go out to eat breakfast. They're having this back and forth who's going to pay for the check and it goes kung fu movie like they literally beat the shit out of each other to pay for this check <laughs> and then at the end there's a surprise but um i read it, the just, script. <laughs> it takes the exaggeration of i mean it all started i went to breakfast with my girlfriend and i said i'm gonna pay this time she's like no it's my turn and we go back and forth and i said you know what it'd be funny is if, if the waitress comes over to hand you the check and i trip her you know, and she, what? Like, yeah, I trip her and I grab the ticket out of her hand, you know, like I get aggressive. And then it just snowballed after that. I just started thinking all these funny things. And so I wrote it down and it's got a lot of interest, a lot of interest. I've already got everything I need for it, except for a location. And then, um, one person, the female, uh, to play the girlfriend because I'm going to play the boyfriend and then and the financial thing, which we're working on. I think we'll, we'll talk about that, but the second one is about, and it's still in its pre-stages. I'm going to be filming this one probably first about a guy that has to go to the bathroom really bad at a sports bar, goes to the bathroom and there's three urinals and guys will totally relate to this. There's three urinals with Left, no right middle, right? Yeah. And there's no arm, uh, block so it's naked. So you like, but there's two huge giant guys on the left and one on the right and this guy's got to go so bad that he decides to go for it so he goes there and these guys are bumping elbows with him um they're, they're talking to him and he's just one of those uncomfortable guys that doesn't want to don't talk to me i'm going to the bathroom and it becomes really funny um and that's called that one's called small talk and we're going to be filming that hopefully within the next couple months i've got pretty much everybody i need i've got everything i need for that and we'll be filming that here in Kansas City. All righty. Um, we just got to find a location with the three urinals, but that shouldn't be a problem. But the reason that I'm holding off right now is because I'm about to travel to, you know, do Houston and Denver. When I get back from those two things, those two projects, we're going to film that. And uh, I'll that definitely look at that. Hard to find. Oh, yeah. That's going to be could, hilarious. Yeah. I mean, it's, I don't think it's going to be that hard. You know, you could probably do two days. Yep. Did you want to get like real, like, uh, I don't know, biker gang guys, uh, who are well, just I already got two guys. So the two guys that, um, one of them's name's Kurt and he is a professional wrestler. Yeah. All right. Here we go. They're just um, big dudes. Huge guy, huge guy. He's a short, he's short, but he's just wide. Like his arms are as big as two of my arms. And, um, the other guy, his name's Angel Medina and he was a famous wrestler uh, from a group called the Baldies from the Bronx. So you can look it up. Is it from Brooklyn or the Bronx? I hate to mix those two up. They have, a, they have a wrestling league in Brooklyn, but you yeah, look up. I think it was like W. I want to say he was an ECW. He was like a big time, big time. His name is, I think he was called Angel, but he was one of the Baldies because he's bald. You can look him up, the Baldies. 
His name is Angel. Huge guy. He's a friend of mine, and he's going to be the other guy. So you get these two huge guys. Trying to pee. And it's hilarious. Oh, it's going to be so funny. And the third guy, the guy that's going to play the guy has to pee, whatever. His name's Kevin, and he's uh, he's in my acting class, and he's got the perfect look for it. Uptight kind of guy. Small guy. It, it's just going to be great. It's going to be so funny. So you want it? This is going to be your first like directing debut. Uh, this will be not. I'm gonna. I'm not directing this one. Um, my buddy's going to direct it, but I am going to produce it. I am going to act in it. I'm going to have a small part in it. Bartender. No, the guy that uh, there's a guy the fourth there's a guy that goes in the bathroom later on toward the end. I don't want to give away the thing, but I go <laughs> in the bathroom at the very end of the thing, and something happens. But um, no spoilers. Yeah. <laughs> no, no spoilers. It's it's pretty funny. Small talk small talk. So those two projects, uh, we're going to get those, those done. And I'm writing my book. My book will be, um, I'm writing a, a book. Um, it'll be published by the end of this year. I've already got all that taken care of. So my book is almost done. Um, I'm doing a police book, uh, based off stories that have happened to me, um, small police stories. And, uh, it's pretty, pretty in- insane. Some of the stories are all going to be good, but so like non like non-fictional, like non-fictional stories, like short stories, short little short story uh, cop stories that actually happened to me either directly or I know of uh, or I was a part of. So that's coming out this year. So my book will be done this year as well. So what's the name of your book? Uh, I don't know yet. <laughs> I haven't thought of it. Uh, I thought about Kansas City Cop or just uh, sounds like an 80s movie. Something like that, yeah. It's just it's short police stories, but you'll be yeah. you'll, you'll be doing that. Uh, the name of the movie that we had that I um, did the Richard Roundtree uh, reading with was called Collar. You know, they kind of just wanted to keep it police themed. Uh, one of the, one thing that one of my first acting teachers ever said when getting into theaters, if you come up with a name that has absolutely nothing to do. Uh, with the story is sometimes more interesting. I can't even imagine how many little nuances are in the uh, uh, in the police department. But if it's uh, short stories and stuff, uh, well, I got a silly question. Uh, why do you want to write it? Uh, I have all these things that happened to me in my life. Pretty dramatic, funny, gross, shocking. Life is definitely stranger than fiction. Um, and I want to share, I want to share these with people so they can see what cops go through. There's some crazy stuff that people don't realize what cops go through. And it'll kind of give you an idea of some of the weird stuff that can happen while you're at home watching TV and sleeping in and stuff. Cops are out there doing these crazy things and receiving crazy calls and dealing with crazy people and situations that you would never see in your lifetime. So it can, it's a way of bringing people into that world and seeing the craziness that they will never see in real life. What could be, you know, or maybe there's people out there want to be a cop. Well, this is what you're, you could be doing. So um, I just want, there's, there's such amazing stories. I just think they need to be shared with someone. So instead of just fading off into nothingness. So. Oh, so it's like homage, a legacy, an archive. Kind of a legacy, homage, um, respect to the people that deal with, you know, because, you know, there's good cops and bad cops and people need to know what the good cops are doing out there because um, sure. they know what bad cops are doing because the media likes to to talk about it all the time. But there's, you know, the cop, the good cops go through some crazy stuff. And you'll, when you read these stories, you're going to be like, oh my gosh, holy well, crap. Well, in 2012, do you remember the cop um, at Oak Creek? Um, fill me in because I'm it was not a shooting sure. that it's, it was, it was a shooting that happened at a temple in Wisconsin. Oh yeah. Yeah. The one that, um, are you talking about the one where he kind of set up the religious people and shot them all? Yep. The young kid. Yeah. It was some, uh, some yeah. kid, uh, he went into a temple, uh, yeah. he the place up, uh, but the cop, uh, intervened because he did end up saving a bunch of lives that day. But in the, in the process, he got shot 15 times. Yeah. There's so many cops and there's going to be, there's going to be some stories in my book that you're just, you're going to realize, you know, it's not for the faint hearted. This book's going to have some pretty crazy stuff, but you'll see what people do to keep you safe every day. It's, it's amazing. 
it's amazing. It's a calling for sure. So it's a thin blue line. It definitely. And it's not for everybody. Um, I, I've lost a lot. Of, I've lost more people in, in the police force than I have in the military. Really? Uh, in the past three years, just in the past three years, whether it be from some kind of illness or getting hurt, another person killing them or something, um, or unfortunately taking their own life. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's, I've lost more people as a police officer than I have in the military. And so going battle. It's, it's crazy. And it's, it's not for everybody, but if it wasn't for those people that, that do that, what they do, then there's a lot, you know, I don't think people realize how safe they would, they wouldn't be. So definitely shout out to all the cops out there. I mean, I've got a lot of cop friends still, obviously that risk their life every single day and they're great cops. And so it sucks when you get the bad ones that make us uh, look bad. There's, and there's so far, there's so far and few of those bad cops. There's really not as many as you would think. So, yes. and they all want the same thing. They just want, you know, they want to help people. They want to help people. It's definitely not for a paycheck. No, I can't imagine that you couldn't get paid enough to do a job like that. Nope. Nope. And some departments don't get paid almost anything, but the people they love, they'll have a love for it. So I think that's what it is. I think, we, well, you know, the one special thing you have in this art form and this platform uh, is getting people to think, telling stories from a different perspective and uh, really shining a light on all the things we really do have in common, you know, to kind of just, uh, I don't want to say break the status quo, but kind of just set the standard on living life, you know? Yeah, I definitely, if I had to take any way, I mean, if people are listening to this, one thing I want them to take from this is if there's something that you want to do in life and, and you know, people, everybody's going to say, don't do it. There's so many people that say, don't do it. Don't do it. You're too old. Dude. You know, there's, it's too hard of a business. There's too many more no's than yeses, which is true. Don't let that discourage you. You do before you die and leave this world, do what it is that you feel like you should do because you don't want to die in regret at all. Zero. If this acting thing doesn't pan out for me, I can say I, I made a movie. I was in on, on screen at least once or twice. Um, I tried it. It didn't work out if that's what ends up being, um, but at least I tried. So definitely, you know, go shoot for your dreams, man. Uh, you'll regret it if you don't, when you get older. So absolutely. And that time's coming. Yeah. I can't wait. I'm excited. And, and just be humble also. I mean, that's another thing is be humble and understand that like all these famous people, they were just regular people too, you know, not so much now because a lot of them don't know what's going on in the real world because they're, they're surrounded by greatness all the time. Um, but there's some great actors that started off with, you know, on the bottom and work their way up, work their ass off to get up there. And so I totally respect those people. Cause that's, it's a tough business. It is really hard and it's only going to get harder, but that's what makes it fun. Yeah, I could agree. Um, when you land something, I mean, it's like, wow, you know, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. So, yeah. I know that feeling where, wow, finally you got picked. Yeah. And you're going to hear the worst thing is hearing. And, and you probably have heard this a gazillion times is we decided to go in another direction. Yeah. <laughs> I'm s- I want I don't, to get that tattooed hate- on my back. I mean, uh, <laughs> I mean, there's been times when I thought, man, I have this, I have this. And you know, so good. Good. and you feel it, you know, it's just like nothing but good vibes only. And next thing you know, you get that phone call from somebody like me and it's like, we decide to go in a different direction. Yeah. We, we, you were great. And the worst thing is when they compliment you on top of it, it makes it the worst. They're like, I'd rather, I would rather them say you were so crappy and we didn't go with you cause you just suck. Actually, I wouldn't want that, but it's Thanks just like, they say, you were great. Oh my God. It was such a hard decision. We just, Oh, we were just, you almost had us and just, uh, we went with someone else. <laughs> You're like, oh, God. So one thing I'm not looking forward to while uh, running the story filmmakers club is, you know, having that conversation where, you know, uh, the director decided to go in another direction where it's like, now nah, I have to say things like, uh, well, we decided to go in a different direction, you know, don't want to discourage you because there's plenty of work 
Uh, mm-hmm. Just keep going. St- keep your keep your head down. Stay low and go. You know, you've got to keep encouraging people and saying, "Look, you this is normal. This is not abnormal. You you did the best you did. You did great. We just decided there was something else about this person that we we decided to go. It could be something as simple as your eyebrows." thicker i mean it could be something stupid i mean um, i hope it's i hope i'll i will never make a decision based on uh makeup or costumes or something like that where it's just like oh don't we have an art form that could sort of supplement that you know yeah i I will never make a decision like that uh i go for I don't, I don't know, but sometimes it's just like you hear it, you know it, you feel it. That's the character. Not so much. It's nothing against the actor. It's never personal. You can't take it personal. You know, and that's the hard thing is I do take it a little bit personal. Only it's my hang up. It's nobody else's. I mean, if if someone says no to me, the first thing I think of that's okay. I got more projects. I just keep going. But then later on in the day, I'll be like, why not? I mean, I thought it was. You know, you start. To, you know, I thought I would be perfect for that, but. Yeah. They don't know you the way you know yourself. So it's, sure. it, it's different, but they got to pick somebody. Somebody has to lose. Somebody yeah. has to lose. And it, it probably is going to be you most of the time. That's just how it goes. You just have to be ready for it. That's all. It, and it'll come, you know, like uh, it, it will come. You seem to be doing fantastic. You know, you're very committed uh, to this art form. I applaud you uh, for your accomplishments thus far. I mean, it's no easy thing to work or get a gig at least once a month to really just like, you know, keep yeah. the momentum and learn from it. So I think you're doing, you know, doing fantastic and you're on the right path. Thank you. Yeah. Just, just keep for the people that are, are just starting out like me, just flood it flood it, flood it, audition way more than you need to do everything more than you need to. And then eventually it will come back around and it'll, but don't quit. Don't let someone discourage you just because you didn't get a part. Just keep going. Just keep improving. Keep improving. And and on that note, uh, this was another episode of inside the Astoria filmmakers club. Uh, if you want to be a part of the Astoria filmmakers club, we meet every Wednesday night at seven 30, uh, Dwayne has definitely been there. Uh, all of our uh, guests on the podcast have been there. If you go to our website, www.astoriafilmmakers.org, click on events. Uh, you're going to see a link that takes you directly to the Zoom call every Wednesday night. Uh, consider joining the chamber. That's the private community with inside the Astoria Filmmakers Club where it's eyes only. Uh, You're going to see and have first access to all the scripts that we're currently working on. Uh, If you are a writer, that's a space where you're going to find all the readers, all the actors to work with you, sound it out, find out where all the kinks are. And if you got a production that's ready to go, uh, talk to us about it, the Astoria Filmmakers Club, because uh, our goal is to become the number one crowdfunding resource for the entire independent film market. You know, everybody in the group is very passionate and loves this business, loves this industry. We love telling good stories. And uh, honestly, the people who can make that happen for you are probably already here in the AFC. And we're about 850 strong right now, you know? So, uh, Dwayne, I got to actually say thank you so much for coming on. Like, uh, you having me. Yeah, man. Like, I'm really excited to see, like, where things go. Uh, I, I love how committed you are and all the people that you've brought on and around the AFC so far, just like great vibed people. And I got to say, like of all the guys like in the AFC, uh, every time we get new members in the group, you're always like one of the first guys to just say, welcome to the group. You know, you're like, you're, you're like Mr. Mayor. <laughs> well, I just, I, I would want to hear that myself. So I just, you know, we're a family. We we're all, we're all searching for that, that win, you know, that, you know, that big role in the sky. So you know, just keep going. Just that's, I just want to keep people motivated and and happy. That's it. You're doing, you're doing the right thing. And I can't wait. I can't wait to see one of your movies, you know, and do not hesitate to share that trailer once you're allowed to. Oh, absolutely. It's, and, and when I get off, as soon as I get off here, I'll send it to you so you can check it out. So (laughs) on that note, uh, everybody uh, go to uh, www.thestoryfilmmakers.org. If you're an actor or filmmaker, you want to become one, uh, join the Astoria Filmmakers Club on our private group. Uh, that Facebook group has, uh, uh, as I said before, over 850 people. You know, we've been doing this for about three years now. 
And, uh, you know, we hit a boom this year and uh, it's only the best has yet to come. So, Dwayne, want to have uh, uh, do you have any uh, last comments or words or anything that you want to tell anybody? Uh, just uh, keep going. If you're an actor, just keep going. Uh, 2023 is going to be the best year. It's going to be the best. I can't wait. You know, I really think you're right. I, I truly do. I, tr- I truly do. I think like uh, we stood the test of time. Everybody who's listening in on this, uh, they're here, they're around, they're committed. They just honestly, they just got to make that decision. And that's just uh, not to give up. Yeah. Don't compete with other people. Compete with yourself. That's it. And like one thing that uh, I would like to say is that uh, uh, regardless of the role that you're going out for, uh, don't don't ever like go into a room uh, making it about the role. Um, The best advice I've ever gotten as an auditioning actor uh, was basically this not to worry about the character, but win the room. Uh, Because like if you're if uh, you leave a good and positive impression on the people in the room, Mm -hmm. they are going to bring you back involved. And that's happened to me multiple times where I've gotten saying, hey, I'm working on this project. Uh, I thought of you. I um, uh, didn't even have to audition. I got the part right away because they just remembered me, the person. So always, you know, win the room. Yeah. Good advice. Thank you, Dwayne. And uh, Fantastic story, man. This was such a great episode. Thank you so much for coming on. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. I look forward to uh, sharing other stuff with you guys in the future. So. I guess, well, every Wednesday night, I know like uh, you always got a good story to tell. I'll try. See you guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Have a great one, Dwayne. You too, bud. Bye now. Ciao for now. <laughs>